Chapter 3, Humiliation, Authority, Hierarchy. We have not yet accounted for the fear of the other that inspires us to deny our desire for authentic connection with others and to place a, and that leads us to place a moat between ourselves and the other that obscures and denies this desire for mutual recognition. The adult alienates the child by recognizing him or her into existence. Because remember, you only become a person when you are recognized by the other in some way as because we are social beings that's how we that's how we become we can't exist without being recognized in some way the adult and children who are not held infants who are not held fail to thrive they don't survive the adult alienates the child by recognizing him or her into existence through the casting of an alienating self other net over the relationship and the child of necessity internalizes this distancing persona and re-externalizes it in becoming what we might call his or her social I. I. Afraid of. What then is the adult and the child afraid of? What underlies alienation? Let me begin with the simplest of examples. If we walk down any street, we pass each other with what we might at first think are blank gazes as if we were entirely disconnected monads. But more careful attention shows us that passing someone, anyone, seems to require that we avert our gaze from the other and resist the temptation to seek the recognition of the other. Although each of us does seek to empty our eyes of presence and turn them into ocular globes, visible from the outside only, in reality, what we do manifest to each other is an aversive presence. We attempt to become blank or absent, but the very work of attempting to be so reveals our residual presence, that we really are in there resisting a pull toward the other, toward each other. This is made evident by the fact that if we do each permit the slightest recognition of each other, we must accompany that glancing blow by a slight nod, usually the slightest possible nod, so as not to endanger our position as decisively, intentionally at a distance, as not in relationship to you. So you go down the street, and then somebody catches your eye, and you just give the littlest, smallest possible acknowledgement of the other's sight, because the pull is there connecting us to the other that we are massively trying to resist in averting our eyes and averting our presence from each other. That pull that we are resisting is the de desire for mutual recognition, and the aversive maneuver is the denial of that desire. We simultaneously evade the other's recognition and deny our own desire to recognize the other in a unitary reciprocity that would affirm our social bond. And we cement our always unsuccessful effort at disconnection or total separation by the meta-claim that we are being who we really are, separated. Thus, if I were to try to break through this mutual distance, by simply looking warmly at the other without quickly averting my gaze, I sense that I would be violating an agreed-upon existential boundary, marking not just the space between us, but the agreed-upon requirement of mutual aversion. But suppose I do attempt this actual recognition of the other's whole humanity not in an exaggerated gesture, but in a genuine extension of my presence toward the other. In order to extend myself in this way, I have no choice but to become vulnerable. I have, so to speak, abandoned the aversive maneuvers that were allowing me to deny my desire for mutual recognition, and revealed my desire, 
by my extension of presence outward toward the other. But what am I vulnerable to that I was not as vulnerable to while averting my presence? I am vulnerable to non-recognition by the other, usually by an intensification of the other's aversion, as opposed to an actual rebuff, which would make the other more vulnerable in revealing an indwelling presence that he or she is seeking to deny the, re the existence of. So if you, if you extend yourself to a person and they, they look away from you, they're not going to say, what are you doing? Because that shows they're actually in there. They'll just avert themselves. Thus my fear, the fear that colors my entire encounter with the other, is a fear of ontological humiliation, of humiliation of my very being that I know I would suffer if I were to extend myself toward the other in a plenitude of vulnerability and the other were to reject that extension by maintaining his or her non-recognition of me in return. The anticipated humiliation is a result of the imbalance of vulnerability in which I cross the moat and in so doing momentarily dissolve it only to be left out there with the other in a way that the other not only does not reciprocate, but in a way that, the also, in a way that also allows the other to reinforce his or her denial. So long as we are balanced in aversion, in aversion, we both conspire to mute our mutual risk of humiliation. But as soon as one of us lets down our guard, by dissolving that guard and becoming present, he or she becomes vulnerable to a humiliating imbalance, placing his or her entire being out there for the other to utterly demean by failing to recognize it. That's why hope is, can be painful. If you dare to hope, you're making yourself vulnerable. And then when that hope is not realized, you hurt more than you, you did before you hoped. The power of this fear of non-recognition cannot be underestimated. It is not a mere psychological detail or some common sense fact about being strangers. On the contrary, the impulse to reveal one's being by extending it toward the other recalls for all of us our original alienation, our original longing from birth to be seen by the other in a way that fully recognizes our humanity and our longing to simultaneously affirm our recognition of the other in the same way. And the risk of non-recognition recalls for all of us the pain of what we have had to sacrifice for becoming our social selves for our very social existence. So while the sting of non-reciprocation of an extension of our being on the street is not traumatic in itself, it is traumatic insofar as it makes manifest in being what had been denied, insofar it raises to an echo a longing that has been denied and sealed off from consciousness in a patterned or structured way across the whole of our existence. Indeed, our capacity to take the risk of revealing our desire to the other is itself dependent on having been so affirmed by another or by others in one's life, through an especially loving family relationship or environment perhaps, or through participation in a social movement, because we can only intentionally extend ourselves with our own agency if we have been so recognized in our existence as social beings. If we have been given the blessing of movement out toward each other, the movement of coming into connection, that memory creates a capacity of and remains a possibility for our everyday social presence, but not otherwise. Thus, you walk down the street, you glance at, at somebody who's passing you, and you give the quick nod. Suppose you, you smile, 
you know, you try to say, hey, I'm here. When the other person averts his head or her head and just walks right past you, barely re re uh, refuses to reciprocate what you've tried to do, it's not that that is so painful. It happens all the time. But it does, the more that you, that you do it, the more revealed that you are when you do it, of your effort, the more that echoes all the way back to your early, early childhood of the longing that you've had from birth to see and be seen. So it's an echo in the present moment that has a powerful shaping history inside your being. That's where... You could sort of, so to speak, the, the street experience is linked to the totality of life preceding that from your infancy. Is we know how to keep our, our distance up by the training we've gone through. And when we break that training and try and re acknowledge the other and be vulnerable to the other, it threatens us with remembering the loss that has existed across our whole lives. Thus, but on the other hand here. Thus, street life in periods of what we might call non-movement consists of a flow of collectively monitored balanced aversion. Balanced because we are always silently negotiating together a reciprocal distance that without this negotiation could at any moment tilt overboard under the pressure of the desire for mutual recognition itself and collectively monitored because the tension created in balancing this desire with the denial of this desire must always be scrutinized together through a kind of collective unconscious attention to maintain our reciprocal distance. So, in my neighborhood, Noe Valley, Everybody knows the rules of walking down the street. How does everybody know it? Because we're working together to create it. We are engaging in a process of collectively monitored, balanced aversion to each other as we pass each other on the street in a period of what I'm calling non-movement, when life is at its most inert, patterned, and repeated without breakthrough energy being present in it of any kind. Mm. To use Sartre's often used term in the critique of dialectical reason, we are always totalizing the street together, measuring our manner of distancing, for example, in how far apart we are walking, in relation to what we are per perpetually co-creating as normal on the street. And the effect of this collectively monitored, balanced aversion is palpable to all of us in the despiritualization of the street. In the flatness and even deadness of our reciprocal being together as we idly glance in passing shop windows or push our baby carriages eyes more or less straight ahead and in general pursue our seemingly important destinations, the importance of which is primarily, in most circumstances, to seem busy, or better, to seem destined in a definite direction that can displace our being present in the moment, at risk of humiliation, onto a putative, urgent future task that denies that risk. Although normally we do not experience this despiritualization of the street because it is rendered unconscious by the conscious association of normality with collective denial, it does become almost astonishingly visible when a social movement does arise that allows us to release our desire for true mutual connection with each other. Then, as was the case during roughly the years of 1965 to 1974, a ricochet of mutual recognition may occur in which we actually pull each other out of our mutual distance, solve the riddle of mutual vulnerability, 
and more or less spontaneously break on through the barrier of our reciprocal denial of desire. At these moments of re-spiritualization of the street, the collective deadness gives way like an ice break to a wonderful radiant joy that is utterly palpable but invisible. Collectively monitored balanced aversion gives way to a quite sudden rotation of connection and mutual affirmation of one another's presence. The bodies relax, the collective vigilance abates, the destinations lose their urgent character, and we emerge into each other's company, relieved at our suddenly being here and being alive, instead of determinedly not being here and having to be muted and withdrawn. Photographs from the rising period of the 60s actually reveals the radiance that I am here describing. The openness of people's smiles, the relaxation of their bodies, the ontological fullness of the entire psycho-spiritual field as captured as a kind of halo even by a still lens. And in the case of the 60s, it was because of this rotating, opening up into mutual presence that so many things happened all at once. Say, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement, the environmental movement, the creating of millions of nonprofits, the explosion of new, more collective experiments in living, from the abandonment of conventional family and career choices laid out as channels by prior generations, to the growth of communal forms of living, in the expansion of government programs for the poor, the liberalization of the Supreme Court decisions led even by a Republican Chief Justice, Earl Warren, and the appearance of warmth and a beginning discourse of love, even in the voice of a major presidential candidate, Bobby Kennedy who had only a few years earlier been a legislative enforcer for J. Edgar Hoover. This same outbreak of opening up enabled the extraordinary transformation of music from the bubblegum rock of the late 50s, early 60s, to Cream, The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, and from the early Beatles of I Want to Hold Your Hand to Eleanor Rigby and Here Comes the Sun, and so many other songs of great depth, insight, and beauty. Indeed, in Penny Lane, the liberatory transformation of the street itself is captured by the, very, by the very joy and compassion within which a Liverpool street scene from the Beatles' childhood is re-experienced through, through a present moment in the late 60s in which the hidden longing and beauty of the lane has become visible in later life. All those characters in the song Penny Lane are re-experienced and represented in the most beautiful and loving way that it is a reflection of what people were experiencing, what the Beatles and Lennon and McCartney were experiencing in the present moment with uh, heartfelt empathy and compassion. Well, Anyway, we can we could discuss Penny Lane and whether you agree with me about that interpretation of it. But what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to make here is that if you see a photograph of the Haight Ashbury of of uh, the Panhandle at Golden Gate Park, for those of you that know San Francisco. If you see a photograph from this period that I'm describing of people walking down the street, Haight Street, and of the Panhandle, the palpable radiance of each other's presence, of joy, of uplift, of, of just joy at being alive, the releasing of our withdrawn selves into each other's space, you can feel it through a still photograph. It's just amazing. Um, and so you can see what's being concealed in the normal street where nothing's happening. Everybody's monitoring their separation from each other, keeping their eyes straight ahead, pushing their baby carriages, looking in the window, got to get to that next appointment, or at least pretend that I have to get to that next appointment as a way of not seeing the person who's right here with me right now. 
that person right there. That's collectively monitored, balanced aversion on the street. And amazingly, we're all doing it together. We're all creating this mutual distance on the street in exactly the patterned way that we each know about without being conscious of it as a way of protecting ourselves and maintaining our withdrawn distance and not being vulnerable to each other. We're protecting ourselves against what? Against the humiliation of non-recognition, against revealing what we long for, connecting with the other person right here, being seen, and our fear of rejection of that longing leads us to engage in these complex collective operations of mutual distancing. Yet this description of the extended opening up of the 60s, well, so I'm going back to the 60s here, yet this description of the extended opening up of the 60s must not lead us to underestimate the true spiritual suffering that resulted from the subsequent ebbing away of mutual recognition and the gradual retreat of our sense of vul vulnerability and presence that gradually pooled us back up within our cellophane barriers. As I showed in my earlier book, The Bank Teller, in particular in Chapter 8 called Clinton and the Id, the Reagan Revolution was actually the culmination of a revolt by the collective superego against the longing of the collective id as that id became no longer able to sustain its vulnerability and the pain of the loss of each other resulting from that historical shortcoming haunts us still, however unconscious we, we may be of its effects, a pain far deeper than the sting I referred to that results yeah. from a mere, a mere mistaken extension of our being in a street encounter. As I showed in my book, Another Way of Seeing, in chapter 10, called Yes We Can? Question mark, we recently endured a repetition of this kind of pain in the first years following the election of Barack Obama in 2008, an election in which large numbers of people rotatingly recognized each other into hope with a capital H. If you recall, that was the, the uh, iconic poster of the Obama campaign, into hope through the mediation of Obama's own televised, symbolic as an African-American and actual presence, only to have that hope disappointed by Obama's and our inability to see how to sustain and reciprocate it against the force of collective denial that sought to rapidly close the opening this hope itself had created. The conversion of yes we can into no we can't involved a collective and widespread experience of the humiliation that had been risked by the vulnerability of hoping together, a pain that shook us to our origins and spurred the emergence of the rage of the Tea Party and what we so perfectly call the forces of reaction. I will return to the critical importance of the collective process by which we burst past our fear of humiliation by the other's non-recognition, and encounter each other in a re-spiritualized social space. And in particular, how to sustain that opening up of social space through a new kind of self-conscious spiritual activism. But for now, I draw attention to the breakthrough experience to show how it reveals what is normally concealed how it makes manifest what is normally denied and not accessible to our conscious awareness. When you see the joy that can burst out in a social movement, in I describe the panhandle at the end of Golden Gate Park, or Hate Street, or streets all over the country, all over the world, where this so the youth movement, whatever you want to call it, the anti-war movement, call it call it the totality of all the movements all at once, the music. That makes you see what we've normally been living with and get insight into it. 
then we can see what the normal street has been like. Those dead routines on the conveyor belt. I'm getting to my, I'm, I'm going to my next important meeting. Uh, I've got to check my email. Uh, all that is, is in the service of evading the present moment by pretend, by keeping up this attachment to the false or outer self system. We will return in chapter 9 to the importance of building out of these outbreaks of mutual recognition a parallel universe within the existing culture of denial, a coexisting, relatively liberated social space in which we can continue to experience each other as loving and connected beings in relationship while we seek to both continue our transformation of enclosure of the system around us and prevent that counter-movement of enclosure from once again swallowing us up. We need a parallel universe in which we can support each other to do that. We can't do it on our own. So we're resisting the enclosure and we're at the same time creating the new space where we can truly see each other. And those new spaces, like that warehouse I was talking to you about earlier, Brendan, those new spaces uh, provide the ground that supports us in resisting our suffocation, re-enclosure, collectively monitor balanced aversion by which we keep each other at a distance and keep our own souls deeply withdrawn inside us. We need a parallel universe to socially support that. But for now, for this chapter, we must continue to name the elaboration of that enclosure system, that norma normal system, as a rotating reciprocal denial of desire as it monitors and sustains itself in the service of the fear of the other that haunts it and that drives it forward in a reeling, outside-of-itself fashion. So, the system here that I'm describing is this, uh, it's almost like a distorted carnival show or something. It's, a, it's, a, it's like the news that changes every day, a new rotation of images that is spinning, sort of trying to keep everything going in its re-hallucination of images, one kind of image after another image, that each of which can be analyzed in these terms. But that is, and so we have to see how is the fear of the other being reproduced? Iran is our enemy. No, it's Russia that's our enemy. No, it's uh, he was meeting with Putin. No, he was. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's that you have to make yourself vulnerable, and the whole thing is built on that, that little tiny, but super powerful fear. The legacy of that fear. Is it? Is it? I hate to say. It, is it like because um, the social order is also controlled I guess it's like we're trying to you're trying to poke at like what is behind all this and there's nothing but us there kind of thing it's That's like a right. wizard of Oz moment almost it is a wizard of Oz moment there's nobody there you go the, there's no group of bad guys that control it all really because you get anywhere near those bad guys you realize they're frantically avoiding the person next to them <laughs> they are they are in a state they're trying they're withdrawn into themselves trying to they don't know this consciously but trying to maximize their wealth and power which protects them against ever having to depend on another person so they're going to get more and more and more of it and then of course more and more image seems to be attributed to that so they try to become successful the most successful the greatest president but of course they can't ever become that because that's an image of the self and not really who you are. So it's part of the chasing of the image to become the perfect other that I was describing earlier in this chapter. From the street to the role to the hierarchy. I began my description of risk of humiliation as the core of our fear of the other. With everyday life on the street, because the experience of being on the street is so accessible to all of us. 
by the way we live out this reciprocal fear on the street, we create each other as strangers. Which is to say, we render each other strange by the act of mutual distancing itself. We do not begin estranged and then come to our wariness of each other. Rather, we bring with us our conditioned wariness undergirded by the anticipation of humiliation. And out of that construct, treat each other as mutually estranged. During a period of rising social movement, when masses of people are mobilized within a common transformative project, people do not experience each other as strangers when they pass each other on the street, but rather as probable co-creators of a new and comradely public space. Thus the stranger, him or herself, is an everyday mutual projection of a withdrawn being colored by fear of recognition, or more precisely by having to hold in check with vigilance the conflict between the desire for mutual recognition and the felt learned need to deny and conceal that desire. Now take the precise condition of this everyday withdrawnness on the street and extend it to how we live this experience with the others with whom we regularly live and interact and with in a patterned fashion at home and at work. I have already shown in the previous chapter how the child develops his or her social self through how he or she is recognized into existence by the adults who condition him or her. And in that description, I emphasized how the child's social self becomes outer or false insofar as he or she is not fully seen for who he or she is in his or her being. But in its earliest forms, this self is not fully formed as a social I but is rather a kind of unformed mold or unfilled in moat, unfilled in moat, like a, a mold of a piece of concrete on the outside of the self, and it's not filled in yet. So it's just like a sensed space that will acquire content as the child is absorbed into the rotating patternings that we call social institutions. I say that these routinized manifestations of collective being are rotating patternings because in spite of our everyday use of the term, there is no such actual entity as a social institution. The concept of the social institution is really a reification. And I'll come back to that word later in the book or conceptual solidification of a moving psycho-spiritual field that is perpetually being created and also being dissolved by those who constitute it out of the co-determinations of their desire for mutual recognition and their efforts to cabin that desire within authorized manifestations of the self, or really of the self in relation. The idea that this moving, conflicted, psycho-spiritual field has the solidity of a thing, <clears throat> the institution, expresses our attempt in everyday language to give to our own defensive and fear-saturated creations a fixed character that would seal off their vulnerability to dissolution. In other words, Everything is in motion in the psycho-spiritual field, in reality. I'm on the street. I try to make contact with the others slightly as I pass and nod, but I keep a certain distance which every, someone entering on the street can see and then internalizes in his or her own approach to the street, and the, the street begins to be created by the rotating patterning 
of how we all pass on that precise level of distance within which we can collectively monitor the way to feel safe with each other. But it's always in motion. There is no actual street as an institution the way people walk down the street in Noe Valley or something. Uh, just in the same way, there's no such thing as any institution. The school, when we talk about the school. The school is being created constantly by a rotation from person to person among students and teachers and administrators. These are roles that we give a fixed character to. And the, the important thing about this is that the world is fluid, more fluid than we think. And therefore, when a movement arises, as happened in the high schools in the early 1970s as they were affected by the 60s, all the, all the things that made up each school began to transform into completely different relationships. Students put out underground newspapers, faculty became friendlier, <laughs> the administration became defensive. Um, the, the rotation is always what is real. As we each enter every social context, desire to connect, learn fear of, of connecting, we develop a way of manifesting that caution and then the person, next person who enters sees that as the, as the baseline for how to exist in this space and internalizes it, and then it's passed on in a, in a rotating way. That is the reality of social existence, a psycho-spiritual field in constant motion. But we give fixed character to that. If you give it a very fixed character, you're trying to identify with it and eliminate the longing to transcend the institutions that we always have. It's okay to talk about the school or the Supreme Court or Congress or whatever uh, to refer to, uh, to that in a sort of general way as a way of describing some social phenomenon, but it's not a fixed thing. It's a fluid thing always coming into creation and always subject to dissolution. And when we get into the book a little farther, you'll see how important this is. Because it shows us that there's opportunity all the time to, that we're not up against a massive world of fixed entities that are crushing us in our little individuality. But rather, that these, these are always fluid spaces that if we can create a ricochet of recognition, of mutual presence, we can influence and alter these institutions. In fact, in, in major instances, dissolve them altogether. Later, when we talk about a little bit about May 1968 in Paris, France, we'll see that in a matter of four or five days, all the institutions of the society dissolved, not for long, they were reinstated, but there was an experience of dissolution that many people have commented on. As the student slogan said of that period, beneath the cobblestones, the beach. In other words, the cobblestones, which seem like just a fixed thing and part of the street, people discovered then they brought with them the whole city, urban life, the institutions of the city, French culture, how you had to be in French culture. The point of the slogan was, the, it's the beach. We can make it the beach. We can recover the beach. So, <clears throat> I'll read that last sentence again. The idea that this moving, conflicted, psycho-spiritual field has the solidity of a thing, the institution, expresses our attempt in everyday language to give to our own defensive and fear-saturated creations a fixed character that would seal off their vulnerability to dissolution. <clears throat> 
I'll put it, make another side comment here. Native peoples, Native Americans in the United States are the ones I know about. They didn't use place names to give a fixed character to spaces. They rather used descriptions of what people, of, of ways people existed together in spaces. And that was their way of describing the space. Here's where we trade, make baskets. Place for making baskets. Lightly held, as opposed to the, f the marsh, the field, 42nd Street. <laughs> uh, our spaces that, that demar demarcate our cities are full of nouns. This street, that street, 42nd Street, 41st Street, those, those place names seemed insane to the Native Americans because they didn't capture any human relatedness but only sort of gave a thing-like character. You could even number it. It was so removed from the human. And it is always warmer when you think of streets that have some kind of resonance and meaning. It's always nicer to walk down them than 41st Street, 73rd Avenue. 727 73rd Avenue. That doesn't really warm the cockles of your heart and make you feel like I'm with others in a beautiful, meaningful space. Okay, back to the text here. Now, if we follow ourselves from our withdrawnness on the street into our workplace, we can see that we support our withdrawn and guarded or wary positions at work by the adoption and replication of a multiplicity of roles. Although this multiplicity is always fused into the unity of one's way of being at work. So, for example, if we imagine I have walked down the street, passing various strangers in my withdrawn and wary state, and I now come into my workplace where I am a waiter, to continue, with, to continue with Sartre's superb characterization in Being and Nothingness from the last chapter. When I make this move, this transition from the street into the workplace, I must convert my withdrawn street self into a new self at work who retains my essential distance from others but yet is integrated with them, with the others at work, in a patterned and regular way. I and everyone else accomplish this by filling the alienated mold of the false self, the mold always subsisting within me since the creation of my misrecognized, misrecognized I. I must fill it with the learned patterning of being a waiter. So I, I have this structure inside me of the false, the false self, the guarded persona that I identify as myself, the boy coming out of childhood in this alienated world, partly loving, partly alienated world. But I, I have this this mold that I fill up wherever I go with what's called for to maintain the proper level of withdrawnness and distance. And here we're talking about I come from the street into the workplace and I'm a waiter, so I fill it up with being a waiter. How to be a waiter. Once again, here's Sartre's description. Let us consider this waiter in the cafe. His movement is quick and forward, a little too precise, a little too rapid. He comes toward patrons with a step a little too quick. He bends forward a little too eagerly. His voice, his eyes, express an interest a little too solicitous for the order of his customer. Finally, there he returns, trying to imitate in his walk, the inflexible stiffness of some kind of automaton while carrying his tray with the recklessness of a tightrope walker by putting it in a perpetually unstable, perpetually broken equilibrium. 
which he perpetually reestablishes by a light movement of his arm and hand. He applies himself to chaining his movements as if they were mechanisms, the one regulating the other. He is playing, but what is he playing? We need not watch long before we can explain it. He is playing at being a waiter in a cafe. If I now, this is me now, if I now put myself in this waiter's place and identify compassionately with what I am now describing as social alienation from a withdrawn longing for authentic connection, I would describe myself as patterning my outer appearance so as to simultaneously integrate me with the other waiters and shield me from the risk of humiliation. This I accomplish by introjecting, taking in, all the mannerisms of the waiter and then externalizing those mannerisms as an outer performance, a performance that both connects me in an outer, relatively artificial way with the other waiters and conceals my true being within. Thus I fill the alienated, conditioned, socialized self-mode, sorry, repeat, thus I fill the alienated, conditioned, socialized self-mold, subsisting since childhood, with waiterness as an other-directed patterning required for the current moment, for my being at work. I am in reality just as essentially withdrawn as I had been on the street a little while before, subject to an important qualification that I shall come to in a moment. I'm just as withdrawn, but I am now convivial about it in the manner of being a waiter with other waiters. So I was on the street with my blank gaze, walking past others. Now I'm in the, I'm at work and I'm I'm lighthearted, sort of. I'm performing lightheartedness in my role as being a waiter. I'm still withdrawn. I'm still keeping others at a distance from my true being. I have filled my false self with the waiter self, which has a convivial aspect, as opposed to going down the street when I was more... I suppose, presenting myself as dead. But here is the qualification. Although the stranger and the waiter are both constructed out of the conflict between desire and fear that I have described, in my role as waiter, I can actually partially realize my desire for connection to others through the medium of my own alienation. Or to be more precise, my desire for authentic mutual recognition is itself realized in part through the very forms of my alienated social recognition, insofar as these roles, as I have been calling them, are the actual carriers within the culture as a whole of what social connection there is. Although I sometimes am describing the desiring self and the fearful alienated self as if they were opposed or entirely distinct aspects of our social being, they are always lived as co-determinations of the present moment. Thus the stranger who averts our gaze on the street simultaneously recognizes us in that very aversion. His presence remains there and recognizes me in the very act of pulling himself away. In the same way, the comradeship of the fellow waiters transmits a reciprocal cathexis of recognition. A, uh, there's, a, there's a recognition there, a bond, that is mediated through the very artificiality that Sartre describes. A social recognition takes place, but we could say that because the desire for mutual recognition that energizes it is transmitted in denied form through the role that I am playing. It is blocked and contained at the surface of the interaction. 
It is the coexistence of the erotic connection with its containment in an alienated form that establishes the paradox of the false self. And as I have said earlier, provides a continual hope of transcendence and transformation. So the false self is not all false. It, it, waiters actually do enjoy each other's company at work to some extent, because there's a channeling through that artifice of an, an element of, of, of desire for mutual connection, for the spirit of the place that we're in and that we're working in. And yet, it is constructed in such a way as to maintain our separation, to keep superficial our arena of bondedness and the flow between us. So we don't actually make contact with our other waiters when we're at work. We don't see the other waiter as a thou, and I as an I, and you as a thou, in a, a true relationship of presence. Instead, we are waiters together, playing that part, which partly is connecting, and also pretty decisively separating and allowing us to continue hiding from who we really are with each other, what we really long for. On the other hand, because the erotic or binding dimension of the adoption of the waiter role is linked to what I am calling a false appearance or outer performance, so this is another way of formulating what I just said. On the other hand, because the erotic or binding dimension of the adoption of the waiter role is linked to what I am calling a false appearance or outer performance. It circulates among the waiters as a kind of collective narcissism. This erotic pleasure at the surface of being a waiter is always drawn from, in Lacan's formulation, my desire for the desire of the other, my attachment to my own image as I seek to adapt my image to what the other appears to desire. Thus each waiter gains an erotic substitute gratification from the rotating mirror image as each conforms his or her social persona to what the others appear to desire and also actually do desire insofar as each exhausts a portion of his or her libidinal energy, desiring energy, in what social connection the group can actually provide. This means that collectively the group exists as a rotating pleasure at the surface, enveloping a collective longing for an authentic mutuality of presence that cannot be realized, of course, it cannot be realized at this surface way of being. The waiters therefore replicate in the alienated work setting the conditioning and alienation of the family in which the child originally becomes attached to and cathects or binds with. Cathects in narcissism the outer self by which he has been recognized into existence by the adult. But to again state the critical shortcoming of Lacan's formulations, the dialectic of self and other reciprocity also transcends at every moment the alienation from mutual presence suffered through the reciprocation of images and carries forward in each person and in the collective as a whole the hope of salvation in a true beloved community, a hope known at a felt but unconscious level by all who live out their alienation from this hope. I talk about this later, but when these, if these waiters organize a union, if they come and in, come into, if they begin to identify with an empowering, relatively autonomous force of labor, a labor movement, and they, they then will shift from that 
surface pleasure of being a waiter, they may shift. They won't necessarily, but they may shift from that surface pleasure of the way they can rotate that, that tray as they take one order after another and put the plates down and see each other doing that and become the waiters in the cafe as a rotating patterning, they may convert that into a more authentic encounter with one another. If they decide to do something like form a union, take claim, reclaim their own existence through that relatively autonomous act, even putting on a button together, as I've either said before or will say later in the book, the moment when you put on the button at the workplace that says Local 47, <laughs> you declare independence from the deferential artificial role that you've been playing because of the strength you gain from each other in true recognition as you emerge into mutuality of presence in the, in the restaurant, in the cafe itself. The space changes from a the very pleasant circus in which you've been enacting your waiter parts into a new space that is more filled with the presence of each other as human beings uh, asserting yourselves as a community in that space. Now let me return to how the... So, so here we're, we're focusing on real life. From the street, now we go into the workplace. What is really going on as a psycho-spiritual field in the workplace? Uh, this field in motion, that's what we're doing, we're looking at. Now let me return to how the social institution of the cafe is constructed as a rotating patterning. Suppose I arrive at work for the first time after walking down the street, passing strangers in balanced aversion and so forth. How do I know how to be the waiter that Sartre describes? Obviously, I must learn the outer way of being, the synthesis of mannerisms of what we might call pseudo-presence from the other waiters. But I am not at all like an alien who has arrived from another planet with no idea how to accomplish this modification of myself. On the contrary, so this is my first day at work. On the contrary, I have grown up in the same world as my fellow waiters, been prepared in the same culture to speak the same language with the same general balance of connotation and denotation, of idiom and inflections of meaning. Also, to the extent that the waiters are male, like the person being described by Sartre, I share a common history of rotating patternings that has produced being a male, or what we call fixedly masculine identity, within the culture. And even more, I have learned through walking and other movement styles, and through sports of a certain shared kind, and through how to manifest my limited presence through the patterned modes of motility to walk like a man in 2017 when I wrote this. This is what I mean by the fact that in integrating myself into the workplace, I must synthesize a multiplicity of roles into a new unity. And all of these roles, drawn from the totality of my conditioned history, embody the unstable conflict between desire and fear. For example, the constrained and somewhat rigid bodily manifestations of patriarchy that must limit the way a male waiter carries a tray and relates to customers. Thus, I, as a new waiter, can learn my waiter role relatively quickly by performing the synthesis required, as all the other waiters, otherwise quite like me and living at this historical time, have already done. I can fairly quickly, through synthesizing intuition, fill up my, holo um, my holographic mold that is, so to speak, ready for any role's content with the role required of a waiter. I'm ready for this by my whole conditioning up to this time. I'm not an alien from outer space. We've all been conditioned in the same pool. Certainly, if all, we're all men 
we don't really warmly interact with our customers. We do it from a distance or one form or another that is already known among us. So I, if I'm entering it for the first time, I can, by synthesizing intuition, f figure out how to join this, this group, how to behave by taking in and then re-externalizing how to be a waiter. A waiter way of patterning myself. As I take this waiter role in by enacted gestures and movements, accompanied by the meta message that this is who I really am, because that's always true of these roles I, uh, that makes them stick in the society as alienated performances, that keeps them invulnerable to being seen through. Invulnerable to being seen through because I present them as if this is, I'm being who I really am. I'm a waiter just like you're a waiter. Of course, it's not who I really am. I'm actually a partially realized, conflicted being longing to transcend these very limited ways that we can relate. As I take this waiter role in by enacted gestures and movements, accompanied by the meta message that this is who I really am, I immediately externalize it as a manifestation of my withness with the others which by enactment establishes me as with them and not with them at the same time. I am with them, but not as a fully present being, but as another waiter, inflected by my unique history and conditioning and by my desire to transcend my separation, although this is transmitted only in denied form so that it is not visible to the others, although they do experience it, just as I do their desire for this same transcendent reciprocity. And when I externalize this waiter role in this way, I pass it on. I rotate it back out into the social field, which then permits it to be internalized and re-externalized by the others. It moves in a circle. The, 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 the way that being a waiter that Sartre described is it moves in a circle from one to the other through a rotation and becomes what the cafe is like. Thus, to the extent that the cafe itself is created by the waiters, they rotate the cafe into existence perpetually by a near instantaneous passing around of their collective being. In the case of Sartre's example, it is the collective being of waiters in the late 1930s early 1940s Paris, perhaps incorporating a mood in the pre-war years of lightness and performance that was seeking to deny the fear of imminent war with Germany. The rotating patterning of Sartre's Café is very different in form from, say, waiters in San Francisco where I live now. Just as quantum physics has shown that entities science had previously perceived as objects can actually be dissolved into waves and particles. So we can see, in the case of the cafe, that what we had previously perceived as an institution can actually be dissolved into a rapidly moving, rotating patterning that carries the intention to both connect and separate those who create it to establish the waiters as at once with one another and withdrawn and protected against each other's deepest authentic recognition. The rotation of this kind of outer directedness or otherness is therefore lively but hollow, a rotation of a surface unconsciously but anxiously guarding itself from the vulnerability within it. If we introduce into our description the other actors in the café, the customers, the suited maitre d', who makes himself like the other maitre d's in the same period and vicinity, the signifying style of the menus, and the signage, and so on, we approach the vast, moving, rotating energy that is the café itself. 
Thus, although the cafe appears to our thought to be a kind of entity, it is in reality, as I say, being brought into being by its very rapid pre-reflective rotations and being partially dissolved by the introduction of the desiring or transcendent impulse into every rotation. This is why the waiters are not Stepford waiters. Their authentic presence continually surpasses their own collective attempts to contain it. And so waiterness is itself continually being modified, absor absorbing new manifestations of presence that are captured and co-opted by the protective rotation of the waiter's collective externalization. So, in other words, there is little tiny little outbursts of connection, authentic connection happening all the time in the cafe or in the factory or in the office that um, that the aspect of ourselves that's trying to maintain our distance and our alienation tends to capture and then make part of the artificial world. In other words, to... It's a little bit like the mole thing where you smash the mallet down every time it pops its head up. Uh, the game... What's it called? Whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. Yeah, it's a little bit like whack-a-mole. <laughs> so, we're going to come back to this, but in big social movements like that happened in the 60s and 70s, things that were breakthrough experiences were tr captured by the, com the commercial culture and represented back to people as if they were completely defanged and normal parts of the, of the alienated sphere. The example I give later in the book, I'm not sure where, is that when the doors, when the doors produce light my fire, a kind of a breakthrough song of um, desire, let's say. It was uh, turned into a Buick commercial as a completely soulless replication of the song without any vitality. That's how, that's how co-optation works. You take, you take the authentic manifestation of desire as it breaks through the constraints that is trying to contain it, and you, you, you turn it back on itself, and Bob Dylan's... Um, what's the name of that song? Uh, Bob Dylan's The Times They Are a Changing becomes an accounting commercial for an accounting firm, Cooper and Liebrand. As happened uh, at the Democratic Convention of 1992, the televised version of it. Bill Clinton was being nominated. Cooper and Liebrand, the accounting firm, t somehow got the rights to the times they are a change in and represented it back as meaning that song is totally consistent with the normal rotating patterning of accounting for money that we are experts in. <laughs> and of course, in some ways, Clinton was the perfect outcome of that. <sighs> Thus, when we view it under this phenomenological microscope, we can see that the cafe is actually an unstable moving field, and it is so in a way that is inadequate to the task of protecting the gathering from its vulnerability to humiliation. Rather than having the security and fixity of an institution, the cafe, insofar as it is a collective alienated from itself, is more like a spinning top that tends at every moment toward falling over. To focus again on the waiters, how are the waiters in their rotating patterning able to keep themselves from falling over? That is, how are they to cement their rotating patterning sufficiently to hold their alienation in place against the threat that the longing for transcendent mutuality and concomitant threat of humiliation by non-reciprocity poses for it? In other words, I want to be sure this is, this, this is clear. Uh, 
desire is always we the waiters are are creating the the cafe through their their place in the rotation of fear of the whole system of the whole society the waiters are participating in that co-creating their their space in separation in the cafe but the aspect of their own longing in their being to truly connect with each other, to break down the artifice, to create a new world in which we could truly finally breathe and be in each other's beautiful, loving presence. That's always poking through as we perform our roles at work. And we, that call, saying this is the cafe and this is how we behave in the cafe, if you wrote it down in a series of rules, it wouldn't work. It doesn't stop the the part of the self of the of the being of the group, the true longing from constantly breaking out in little ways. The workers might revolt. They might start smoking marijuana and sitting in the center of the floor and putting their arms around each other and celebrating the universe. So the question is how how can alienated collective being keep itself in place so that it isn't subject to these to this constant or it is it minimizes its vulnerability to the constant pressure of, of desire the answer to this is that a cafe as a rotating patterning gives itself the modification of a hierarchy an imaginary top-down ordering whose purpose and function is to monitor and enforce the security of the group's alienation from itself. A hierarchy, as I am using the term, has nothing to do with one person being able to tell the other what to do, but rather with a collective modification of consciousness itself. For each person who is delivering over his or her being to the waitering role, perpetually internalizing its contours and synthesizing and re-externalizing these contours as a way of being, knows, each person knows that the group's alienation is perpetually destabilized by the desire that transcends it and must be guarded against. And so the group spontaneously and in its very being grasps that to secure itself against that risk, it must reflectively watch itself and install a normative order on top of itself that it, as a nexus of alienated persons in flight from themselves, can exist as underneath. The new waiter thus defers to the more senior waiter, that waiter to the line manager, perhaps the maitre d', the line manager to the on-site boss, the on-site boss to the owner. By deference, once again, I am not referring to doing what you're told, but rather to pretending to be under another who is above you and who is charged with monitoring and enforcing the group's alienated unity. If a waiter does not act like a waiter, he or she will be corrected by the hierarchy. But more important, everyone does act like a waiter by deferring through the very being of their role itself to someone above them with whom the group has created and charged with authority for cementing the group's alienation from itself. So, what I'm saying is, You've got the people all playing the role, but, but the role is, is outer self, it's an artifice. It has some connecting element, but it's, it's, it's an artifice that is like a spinning top. It's in danger of falling over all the time because of the pull of desire to break through it. And so it has to be kept in place. Well, the way it's kept in place, if you remember that alienation, social alienation, is something that everyone thinks they want to keep in place to protect themselves from the humiliation of becoming vulnerable to each other. So everybody is like in flight from each other. 
through the role system that's being created at work. How, how does a group try to prevent that humiliation from occurring of being truly vulnerable, who you truly are? I'm saying you create a, a imaginary hierarchy that, in which you exist under someone else who is above you and you act in accordance with what the person above you expects and you are and whom whom you are underneath that experience of being underneath with someone above you is imaginary it's not i'm not talking about whether the person can actually order you around and fire you i'm talking about behaving as if you're underneath them acting deferential everyone is deferring to how you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to enact yourself. Everyone is defer in the act of deference, the power to revolt is contained because everyone is deferring to the existing network as if it were ordered in a top down fashion. As if you had your place and you have to you had to reproduce it. It's a kind of uh, um, I don't want to call it a weakness, but it's a kind of a, it's because being is not confident in its own core that people become deferential in that way. It's it's a, a way of, of keeping the instability of the situation contained through a common strategy. We develop the hierarchy. It's not. There's no big boss up in the sky that is coming down to impose it on us. A, a small group of capitalists smoking cigars in the back room who are putting this in place. This is something that's created out of the alienation of the group as a whole to maintain itself from seeing what it most longs for. And if we could see what we most long for, we would get rid of the system. We would create a new society based on love community, cooperation, and mutuality of presence. But we're afraid of doing that. So we create hierarchies, which we defer to. The imaginary nature of the hierarchy, of all hierarchies, is seen most easily if you imagine waiters playing their roles in a cafe without a hierarchy you will see that to the degree that the waiter role is false in the manner I have been describing, we cannot even think of a gathering of waiters without someone being in charge. Because the gathering's very decapitated nature means that it lacks any ground to stand on. The gathering must create an author or authority to ground itself and sustain itself as real and to permit each waiter to carry himself off as who he really is in his waiter role. However unfamiliar this characterization of a hierarchy as a modification of collective consciousness may be, I would point out in passing that since Freud it has been taken for granted in psychoanalysis when describing the intrapsychic life of the individual. It was Freud himself who pointed out that the ego gives itself the modification of the superego to protect the ego against the wishes of the id. Although what he was here describing was a deference internal to consciousness. However, in the context of this book, I would say that he was unknowingly describing the alienation of the individual person conceived in isolation from his lived reality. If we introduce him or her back into the actual psycho-spiritual field of his or her social world, we can see that he or she is situated within an alienated rotating patterning that projects and then internalizes an imaginary top-down ordering, characterized by collective deference to authority to guard itself against its own collective longing that perpetually escapes its role boundaries. Within, the frame, within Freud's frame of reference, that social reality is the family, and thus what he is actually describing in his theory of the superego 
is the collective internalization of hierarchy as an observing and monitoring modification of social consciousness within the actual surrounding social world of the family with its inherited alienated role system. So Freud says it's natural, it happens in everyone, that at the age of five the child internalizes a superego, a conscience, or a, 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 an observing part of the self that monitors how the self is to contain the wishes of the id, which, by which he means the sex instinct or uh, impulses, aggressive impulses, sexual impulses, in his frame of reference that are constantly trying to break through that ego, and the ego, in order to maintain its compromise with reality, internalizes a superego to oversee itself and make sure that it doesn't get out of hand. Well, this, this is accurate enough in how children become conditioned to accept the world and behave in accordance with the world, roughly in that time period of the age of five, although it starts much er earlier than that but it becomes more fixed in the child's consciousness around the age of five. But the point here is that, that what I'm saying is that the child, there is no superego, that the child perceives the parents behaving and adults behaving in accordance with obedience to a world as if someone were above them telling them they had to all be this way. So the child takes that in as well and imagines there's something above this this, this world, there's a hierarchy going down through the dad that, that says we have to all act this way. It's just an internalization of alienated social relations which have you, uh, d created the hierarchy as a way of maintaining itself and preventing itself from sp spinning over like a, the spinning top that it is and all hell breaking loose, which in this context means the desire for a more real world and the vulnerability that would entail and the risk of humiliation that would be brought out in everyone if that happened, that could happen. To prevent that, this, this deference, this behavior that produces the hierarchy is constructed within the group and becomes an aspect of everyone's consciousness. And that's why we all have this tendency, but there's, as if the boss is above us, the president is above us, we must defer to the judge, we must, we must uh, defer to the father or the mother or... That aspect of deference is what I'm addressing. That creates the hierarchy and conformity to the world as it is. Against the impulses in all of us to break through that and dissolve it. And of course, the impulses to do that are a secret. <laughs> In other words, they're contained within all of us. We don't let each other know it as much as we can. We, we, we're in flight from that, to prote each to protect ourselves because we're all in our state of mutual separation from each other. We can't get together. If we, when we can, if we could get together and confirm the secret that we are all longing to get out of this, then the father could burst into tears and open his heart to his children, and <laughs> the kids could put their arms around their father's neck and say, I love you, Dad, and I'm so glad we're all here together. And now we can love being with each other instead of boss each other around and play these distancing roles. So, okay, I hope you get my point here. Mm -hmm. Thus, what Freud was unknowingly describing was the origin of alienation within the family as a rotating patterning of mutual distancing, although longing to transcend itself, a process which is carried forward in later settings, suffering from the same reciprocal separation and the same artificiality of collective self-manifestations. Begins in the family, but it's also 
replicated in this workplace that I'm describing. Deference to hierarchy as a way of maintaining the alienated ordering in the face of a desire to go beyond that and to connect with each other in a more vulnerable, more profound way. An aside, nothing I am writing should be understood to mean that real power is not exercised in the workplace. Those in control of workplaces, the owner, the on-site boss, the line manager, and so on, do have, and of course do exercise, the power to hire and fire. The power of these owners of the means of production and their representatives will be supported by government officials capable of physical force if necessary. And these real social relations are encoded and legitimated in the law, which we'll come to in Chapter 5. But unlike my views in my youth, when I believed that the threat of force was behind and causing the alienation that I have described, I now see this relationship the other way around. And in fact, this is one of the key points of this book. That is to say, it is the fear of the other that causes the real power relations, rather than the converse. And it is this fear, underlain by the fear of humiliation, that is the driving force in reproducing society's injustices and inequalities. To this point I will return in chapter 8. Thus the most precise way to account for the hierarchy is to say that it is the means by which an alienated group secures itself against the fear of the other that haunts it. And the group brings this hierarchy to itself through a series of human gazes spread upward, in quotes, within itself. The hierarchy is characterized by a distribution of authority and deference in which a few enact authority to monitor and enforce the group's behavioral code, while the majority enact the deference of underneathness to achieve the same end. Violations of what we might call the code of alienation, in which stabilizing the patterning of contained fear of the other is the group's objective, will be corrected by the collective as a whole through peer pressure and even if necessary through state officials, who are participants in the society-wide participation in the alienated system as a whole. To synthesize the points made thus far, each newborn child is born seeking the transparency and mutual presence of authentic mutual recognition. But the adults whom the child encounters pass on to the child a fear of the other carried forward from past generations into the present one, which requires that the child develop a false outer self that forms the basis of the child's social I. This misre misrecognition is coercive because to be a social being means that one must become who one is recognized as and that, that, and that recognition, even though it is a misrecognition, establishes for every child what social connection there is. Becoming alienated is thus a condition of social membership while initially the child's alienated social self is something like a mold without content, a kind of specular eye that precedes the social eye, as Lacan put it. The elaboration of social interaction, supported by the signifying power of language, but also by the totality of society's roles that are intuited in our, in our being prior to their signification in language, the elaboration of social interaction through these forms gradually fills this mold with the content of the multiplicity of roles that are unified in the child's sense of him or herself in his or her social existence. The reciprocity of roles pervading the growing adult's world contains and masks from both self and other the deep inner longing for mutual recognition while guarding both self and other against a vulnerability to each other and a risk of humiliation that from each person's isolated vantage point feels too painful 
to even become conscious of. The alienated network of roles thus formed monitors and enforces itself through the collective installation within itself of an imaginary hierarchy and through this hierarchy seeks to deny the collective fear of the other and seal off the inner desire to break on through to the other side, as the Doors put it. In social movements and other extraordinary moments, such breakthroughs do occur, but we have not yet figured out how to sustain them by sustaining the psycho-spiritual field that can support a loving world. And the last chapters of the book are about that, about how to sustain that psycho-spiritual field when a breakthrough does occur. Okay.